morning and welcome to our online service. I'm Chaplain Amy Bauman with For His Glory Ministry, and I'm so glad that you're choosing to worship with us today. Don't know much about For His Glory Ministry? Well, we are a spirit-led ministry feeding the world with word and deed. Our word part of our ministry is what you are watching right now, Truth in the Streets. Our Sunday sermon, which airs every Sunday on different social media platforms all over the world. We also have a Tuesday teaching, which is the chair, and a Facebook page that encourages everyone daily with morning devotionals, different devotionals throughout the day, ways that they can be a part of For His Glory Ministry and find out all the ways God is moving. We also have the deed part of our ministry, which is equipping the needy, feeding the hungry, helping the slave, giving people the basic necessities that they need so that they can encounter Jesus. Things that we take for granted like clean water, food, and even Bibles. And those are going throughout the world right now. Specifically, we're working in Pakistan and in India. But we can't continue to do this, help, and move throughout the world without your help. And so if you would like to become part of our family of supporters, there are two ways that you can help right now. You can mail your gift to For His Glory Ministry, P.O. Box 15, Hamilton, Michigan, 49419, or go to my website, amybauman.com, and click on the Donate. You can securely donate your gift and help in all the ways that God is moving and for His glory ministry. But we're going to get started with our service right now. Typically, it lasts between 35 and 45 minutes. We start with worship. We typically have a video, and we dive right into the sermon. And our prayer is that you will just find this time and feel like there's a place where you belong, that you are coming alongside other believers to unify your faith all over the world, that you will equip you and help you as you start this new week, and that you will renew your mind so they become more and more like Jesus. We are just so glad that you're here. Let's dive right into worship today. Your nature, so will I. I 
can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace If creation still obeys you, so will I Bow and reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the Cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, we'll sing again a hundred billion times. down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak Hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind so There's so much great found in the small. A full life of potential in a heartbeat. A massive tree in an acorn. Trillions of atoms in a speck of dust. So much said in a look. So much history in a scar. So much comfort in silence. The faith to move mountains in a seed. The greatest gift in pennies. A timeless sacrifice in a few breaths. The greatest of man in a servant. The universe. 
universe is great in the small. Stars 1,000 times the size of Earth, just specks in the sky. Salvation in the simplest of prayers. The gift of eternity in an instant. Freedom from bondage in a choice. Fullness of life in the darkest of times. Power of resurrection in a word. The greatest significance in the smallest of steps. Can you see it? May we all come to see the great in the small. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Thank you so much for joining us and being part of our worship today. This is one of my most favorite parts of the week to be able to spend it all with you. So thank you. I'm so glad that you're choosing to worship with us today. Uh, I have a lot to talk with you about as we talk about the great and the small. But before we get started, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for this word that you've given me. And I just pray that you will open up our hearts and our ears now, Lord, for what it is that you want to say. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. And I just pray that you will anoint me so that I may speak your truth with love. We love you and praise you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I was um, getting ready to uh, put the sermon together for this week, um, there's, it's obvious as we look at the news and listen to the radio and, and watch our phones that um, we're being pulled pulled in a direction that is far from God. And so I'm praying that um, these words will just open up your hearts and your minds and your spirit to the battle that is happening um, between the world and us as followers of Jesus and those that are um, searching out and, and looking for truth. And um, things seem to get more and more and more complicated with more distractions and definitely more discouragement. And somewhere along the lines, the simplicity, the simplicity of life has fallen away. And the idea that bigger is better has made its way into the world. And as I was kind of researching this and kind of trying to get an idea of, of what's out there, I wanted to look into some slogans that are used in, in different advertising as, you know, what are some of the messages that are coming our way today and what does that look like? So here are some of the messages and slogans that I found when I, when I looked at the idea of bigger is better. Big names, bigger party, bigger in Texas, better in a Dodge, eat big, lift bigger, dream bigger, do greater. We're bigger because we're better, bigger, better, cheaper, the bigger, better bus line, Big brands, bigger savings, snack a little bigger, and tell a bigger story. That reminds me of my grandfather when he would go fishing and the kind of the stories that he would tell when he would come back that the, the fish, fishes were always bigger in his stories than they were in the bucket. And um, I think about him when I think about tell a bigger story. But somehow this messaging comes to us, creating the illustration, creating this illusion that if it's not bigger and better, then we're missing out. So we start looking for the bigger and better thing. We keep our eyes open on the horizon for some bigger, better thing that's out there that we just are waiting to grab onto. And I'll admit, I was right there. 
Several years ago, I was watching the commercials, I was listening to the radio ads, I was watching the people around me, and I was attracted to the bigger, better life and, and all that that entailed. I wanted the bigger house and I wanted the better car and I wanted my grass to be greener so that it looked like we had everything under control in our house. Everything looked perfect. Everything looked great. And uh, I wanted to make sure that our kids had the name brand clothing and that we presented ourselves to the world as our best self. Now, a lot of the reasoning behind that was because we were so broken. We were struggling so much that I wanted everybody to think that we were okay. I wanted to present to the world this image that we were, we were good and we looked good uh, even if we weren't good. But we weren't living our best life and everything that we were trying to do, all of those illusions, uh, everything that we were trying to portray to the world was exhausting and only put us further and further in debt and uh, we missed out. We were missing out on what life was really about. How many of you have felt that same way? That you have spent so much of your time, uh, one of two things, searching for the bigger, better life, and secondly, trying to portray to everybody around you that you were okay and, and that you were fine and, and that everything was good on your side of the street. On top of all of this, right, all of the illusions, all of the things we're trying to portray to the world, all of the things that we're fighting and all of these messages, we create these acronyms like YOLO, meaning you only live once and you have to make yourself better and, and enjoy each day and present your best life and not worry about the future because you only live once. I mean, you don't want to miss out, right? This type of thinking, these slogans, this mindset comes into our lives. You know, we're bombarded by all of these messages, but for us, it becomes this slow fade. We, we start to turn our eyes and our feet start to follow. And we step off the path and we step away from God's truth and we start believing the world and what the world is telling us. I don't necessarily blame the advertisers. I don't necessarily blame what they're doing in their jobs and, and all of the slogans, I, I don't necessarily blame them for that. When we think about the enemy who has infiltrated this world and is trying to distract us from God's plans, I blame him, right? He's the one that's come in and is pushing this idea that you only live once, so you better get out there and enjoy it. And disregard that there is a heaven, disregard that you, um, you know, this, this life is only temporary, disregard the plans that God has for you, and just YOLO. Go buy the bigger house, buy the bigger car, work the long hours, stay away from your family, spend the money that you don't have, keep striving for that bigger and better Thing. He's distracting us though from our purpose. He's distracting us from our identities and who created us. He's distracting us, the enemy, from what's really important and what better way to distract us but from the one of Jesus' principal messages than by making us believe that bigger is better. And if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn with me to Matthew 13. 
starting in verse 31. Now, you can find this parable not only in Matthew and Mark, but also in Luke. But I really loved how it was laid out in Matthew, and that's why I want to look at that passage today. So Matthew 13, starting in verse 31. This is the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. Jesus is talking. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, if you were with us last week, we talked about um, parables and how parables were used to draw people closer to God's truth. And so what I love about Jesus is that he is teaching these people that are coming to, to listen to him, and he's using examples that are around them. And If you've ever watched any of the movies about Jesus' life, you see Jesus. He's not standing in a room like me. You know, he's not online. He's not standing behind a pulpit. He's actually walking and and going uh, on a journey, and people are coming to him, and he's uh, looking at things around him, and he's, he's talking to them and sharing with them the gospel using these parables so that they could understand. So he's just walking along and says, you know, look at this tree and, and look at this mustard seed and, you know, look at this. And so that they could actually be part of the, the teaching and fully understand. So he's using all of these examples that are around him. And he wanted the people to be able to understand using things that they knew about. So you'll note when I read this passage, Jesus wasn't saying the kingdom of God is like a skyscraper. Well, that wouldn't have made any sense to the people in that day because there weren't skyscrapers. So he was using illustrations that they would understand and they understood what a mustard seed was and how big it would grow with just a tiny seed. Now, if you're not familiar with a mustard seed, mustard bushes reach an average mature height of between 6 and 20 feet tall. And some plants can reach 30 feet tall with the perfect growing conditions. So the crowd understood how a small, teeny tiny seed, as my my granddaughter would say, teeny tiny, could grow into this large plant and tree, and Jesus could compare this to the kingdom of heaven. He was trying to tell them that the kingdom advances through the small and seemingly insignificant things, just like that mustard seed. But he was showing them, look how it grows. And this would make sense to them. They could see how a small seed, a small act, a small word, a small gesture could grow the kingdom of God just like that small seed could grow that 30 foot tall mustard tree. He also could make the people understand that they could be a part of that with with all of their small gestures, small words, small ways to show each other that they loved each other. And then what I love about Jesus is he goes right into another parable and starts talking about yeast. And it's really, you would think, well, okay, those are two totally different things, but actually they're not. He isn't talking about a small loaf of bread when he's talking about mixing yeast in. Like for me, I used to have this bread maker, right? And I'd have to pour in this tiny little bit of 
of yeast for just two loaves of bread. And, and, and it's amazing what just that tiny little bit of yeast did to make the dough rise and to make the bread work. And I would, I would do that maybe once every couple of weeks and make our family a couple of loaves of bread. But he's talking about yeast that's going to be mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it's worked all the way through the dough. And that's a lot of flour. If you're, if you're trying to think about yeast working through 60, 60 pounds of flour. But what he's showing them is that it's just a little bit of yeast is able to change all of this flour. And people could understand this. This could make sense to them and they could apply it to their lives. So what is, what is this trying to tell us? What was this telling the people of Jesus' time and what does this mean for us today? This could be really challenging when all the messages that we are getting from the world is that bigger is better. It could, hard, it could be hard for us to understand when we're talking about small seeds and little bits of yeast. And when we're focused on bigger is better, we could lose sight of the significance of the small because we keep thinking that it needs to be big. So when we're thinking that, well, it really needs to be a big gesture, well, then we, for some reason, we don't make that cup of coffee. We don't send that card. We don't smile to the person in the checkout. We don't send that $5. We don't do the small things because we think, well, they're just, they're really kind of too small. I, if I don't have $50 to send to that charity organization, I better not send it. I mean, what are they going to do with just my $5? That's really not a lot. Or what about buying someone's coffee? They're going to think I'm a cheapskate because it was only $3. Why should I do that? I should probably wait until I have enough money to like take them out for lunch or for dinner. You know what? I'm too busy right now putting my groceries on the belt and I don't have any more smiles left for me. I'm, I'm just, I'm not even going to try to say hi to the, the lady ringing me up because I'm just, it's just too much today. I've just had such a bad day. I just don't have anything left in me. And what's that smile really going to mean for her anyways? Have you been there? I have. I've, I've walked through all the reasons why I shouldn't do it because they were just small, seemingly insignificant acts of kindness or generate generosity or love. And I thought, you know what? They're not going to really get it anyways. It's not going to really mean anything. It's not this big gift. It's not this big gesture. It's really not this big thing. So therefore, it's really kind of small. I don't think they'll get it. I don't think it's enough. I think they're going to want more. And for some reason, when we have this mentality, it not only seeps into the way that we operate in our day-to-day -day life, but all of a sudden we're too busy going after that bigger and better life. We're too busy to enjoy the simple things. We're too busy and we miss out on the sunset and the sun rises. We miss the beauty in creation uh, like we watched in that video of, of the small things, the butterflies, the birds, the brook, the, the little initials carved in to that wood showing someone's love for each other. We miss the whisper of the Holy Spirit. We miss all the gifts that God gives us every day because we're waiting for these really big moments. And there's so many small ones that we're missing out on. Because all the while these tiny moments are passing us by, 
we're saying, God, where are you? Aren't you listening to me? Don't you hear my prayers? And because we're not attuned to the small whisper and the small things, we miss him saying to us, I am listening. I am hearing your prayers. I am with you. Didn't you see me in that beautiful sunset last night? Didn't you see me in that person that bought you that cup of coffee? Didn't you feel my presence when that person came up and gave you a hug and, and told you how much they appreciated you? Didn't you see me when that person called just to check in and see how you were doing? That was me. That was me in the hug that you got. That was me in the cool breeze that came on that really hot day. That was me in the meal in, that came to you by that friend. That was me in all of those ways. I was talking to them. I was telling them to send you that hug and to send you that meal and to give you that smile and I sent you that breeze. My friends, don't get distracted by all the other voices of the world, i.e. the enemy who is telling you that bigger is better. No. If we look to Jesus' life and how he lived and how he walked on this earth, there were so many small things that he did. So many things he did that looked small and insignificant. But think about their impact. He turned water into wine. No, he didn't go to the Chateau Montalena that has bottles of wine that are like $300 a bottle, grown on the beautiful, luxurious, uh, rolling hills of California. No, he, he turned water into wine. And the people came out and said, wow, you saved the best wine for the last. Usually that's not how it goes. It was incredible wine made out of water. Don't forget that he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He could make so much out of just a small meal. And look how many thousands of people he fed and how much love he showed them when the disciples were saying, send them away, they've been here for so long and they, we don't have anything to feed them. And Jesus said, no, you will feed them. And, and look what he made. If you were to look into that time in, the, in Jesus' life where he was walking among the people, he was talking to the hurting. He was healing the leper. He was eating with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. He wasn't buying them cars. He wasn't uh, giving them loans. He wasn't, you know, building them houses. He was doing small, seemingly insignificant things by showing love and compassion and, and human contact with those that had been forgotten and rejected from society. And yet, look at how that small seed of love got planted and grew for those people that he connected with, for those people that experienced his love. And he didn't promise us a bigger, better life. No, he promised us everlasting life. And he was honest about this. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So many times we want the easy way out. 
We don't want it to be challenging. We don't want it to be hard. We're looking for this illusion that things are going to be better in a bigger house. Things are going to be better with more money. Things are going to be better if we were just to move on this side of town. Things would be better if I just drove this particular car or if I used this kind of skincare line or if I just went to this salon. This is like the best salon to go to and my hair will look so much better if I just do this. There's always going to be something that's advertised and shown and marketed as bigger and better. And yet every single time we're presented with that, it's not going to change our lives. It's not going to fill the hole that's in our heart. It's not going to give us peace. It is not going to give us joy. It's going to maybe take us farther away from God by thinking that that is going to be the fix that we need that's going to fix us. And what Jesus was telling the people is that these small things that you can do can grow a field filled with believers. This small seed can grow a field full of mustard. This little bit of yeast can go through all of this flour and make such an overflowing abundance of kingdom work. But it only takes a little. It only takes a little bit. My prayer for us today, if I could pray a prayer for us today, would be that we would receive his perfect shalom. Nothing missing and nothing broken. That we would understand that Jesus has paved a way for us and, and filled this Bible with truth that we could use as our foundation to live in this broken world. That we can know that life is not going to get easier. If anything, it's going to get harder. We can turn on the news and look to see what's happening around the world. And if anything, it's getting more and more challenging. We're seeing that there are so many people suffering and hungry and homeless and hurting. All these people, you know, and there's so many different places throughout the world where, you know, clean water and food and Bibles are, are things that, don't come like they come here in the United States or in other countries. You know, one meal a day is, is even hard to get. And they're, they're, the infrastructure of the cities and, and jobs, and, and then you add COVID, you know, there's so many people that are hurting. So we have all these people that are hurting. Then we have all these people that are out there searching for the bigger, better life, for the YOLO, you only live once. And the enemy is wreaking havoc knowing that he only has so much time left before Jesus returns. And then there is, you know, some people that are really trying to just do what they're supposed to do every day and, and, and go to work and come home and, you know, and all of us, all of us can be distracted by the enemy, distracted by his lies distracted by this illusion, this idea that there's somewhere out there, there's this bigger, better life that we can grab onto. But here's the truth. And this is, this is what I want you to hear today. We are called to follow Jesus and live our lives serving him, live our lives like he lived. And that means to follow his teachings. That means to focus on his truth. That means to advance the kingdom through these seemingly small 
insignificant ways for his glory. Planting seeds of love and joy and peace, mixing our efforts into the world like 60 pounds of flour until it's worked throughout all of the dough. See, we, we have to find the balance between living in this world and preparing for the next. We have to keep our eyes open to the truth and not be distracted by the lies of the enemy. We have to see that we can be the change. We can grow the kingdom. We can do great things because there is great in the small. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this truth today. And I know, Lord, that there are so many people out there struggling. Some are struggling just to have one meal a day, struggling with maybe unemployment, struggling with uh, sick family members, maybe struggling with sickness themselves. And on top of all of that, there's just this battle, Lord, this relentless battle from the enemy who's trying to take us off the path and, and discourage us and, and take us out. And, and we know, Lord, that, it, that you told us that it will be hard to live in this world but we're going to stand on your truth today, Lord, and know that you are equipping us, that you've given us your truth, that you've given us a foundation to stand on, Lord, and we can believe that you have overcome the world. You have paved a way for us, Lord, and all we need to do is follow you. All we need to do is fix our eyes on you and away from the illusions of the world and what the world can offer us. Because we know, Lord, that those are just empty promises and that they won't give us joy. They won't give us peace. They won't give us a bigger or better life. I just pray for each person listening today, Lord, each person watching, that you will meet them in a real and tangible way, that you will be their Jehovah Jireh, that you will provide for them exactly what they need, and that they will receive, Lord, your healing. They will receive your peace. They will receive your love. They will receive your forgiveness. And you will help them take one step at a time, one day at a time, until you come again. We thank you for this time. We ask that you bless us this coming week and walk with us each day. And we ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus, who saves. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being here. If you need prayer, we would love to walk alongside of you and pray for you. You can go to my website, amybauman.com, and click on the prayer wall. And you can leave your prayer there and your request. And not only will I pray for you, but it's set up so that other people can read those prayers and pray for you also. I just want to remind you that we are a unified body of believers all over the world, walking together, stepping together one day at a time, waiting for Jesus to return, living our lives, remembering that there is great in the small. Thank you so much for being here, and until next time, until we can be together again, be blessed.